I'm John Tolliver and this is History in Five and I'm going to tell you five things you should know about John Hay and his extraordinary life from Abraham Lincoln to Theodore Roosevelt. John Hay was born in 1838 in Indiana and moved to Warsaw, Illinois on the Mississippi River when he was three. His dream was to be a poet, but he wound up volunteering to open mail and write letters for Abraham Lincoln in Springfield. Lincoln recognized Hay's gift as a writer and invited him to join the White House staff. So many of the intimate details of Lincoln come from Hay's diaries, letters, and other writings. What Lincoln ate for breakfast, an egg and a cup of coffee, how he sat a horse with surprising ease, how he told a joke, usually ending with the stomp of his gigantic foot. How Lincoln pondered stacks of court martial convictions, always with an eye towards mercy. Hay was also with Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address and with Lincoln at his deathbed. John Hay wrote essays, a novel, and yes, poems. With his fellow White House secretary, he eventually wrote a 10-volume biography of Lincoln. For three years, he wrote editorials for the New York Tribune. Horace Greeley called Hay the best editorial writer he'd ever hired. He kept up a lifelong correspondence with many of the literary luminaries of the day, Mark Twain, Henry James, William Dean Howells, and above all, with his best friend, historian and pundit Henry Adams. Theodore Roosevelt called John Hay the best letter writer of his age. Following in Lincoln's footsteps, Hay was an eminent and guiding figure in the Republican Party throughout its first 50 years. Marrying the daughter of Amasa Stone, who was one of the wealthiest robber barons in America, Hay moved to Cleveland and donated generously and regularly to Ohio candidates Rutherford B. Hayes, James Garfield, and William McKinley. Moving to Washington, eventually living in a house facing the White House across Lafayette Square, Hay served as Assistant Secretary of State to Rutherford Hayes. He declined Garfield's plea to stay on, and then 15 years later, McKinley appointed him ambassador to England. He was serving in London when the Spanish-American War broke out. McKinley called him home in September 1898 to take over as Secretary of State. Hay won the trust and respect of the other so-called great powers, namely England, Germany, France, Russia, and Japan. When McKinley was assassinated in September 1901, Hay was at the president's deathbed, as he had been at Lincoln's. Roosevelt beseeched him to stay on as Secretary of State. Hay, who had been like a son to Lincoln, now became a father figure to Roosevelt, who was 20 years Hay's junior. While Roosevelt waved the big stick, it was Hay who walked and talked softly. He defined his philosophy as the Monroe Doctrine and the Golden Rule. That is to say, he was emphatic in expressing America's interests abroad, yet he strove to be fair and forthright, appreciating that goodwill, and not merely might, would win the high ground for his country. He negotiated the Open Door Agreements, ensuring equity of trade with China and preventing the great powers from carving up China like a pie. He negotiated a series of delicate treaties that enabled an American-controlled canal across Panama. Employing his own deft version of shuttle diplomacy, Hay nursed the trust of Russia and Japan and patiently nudged them towards resolution of the colossally violent Russo-Japanese War. Hay died on July 1, 1905. Two months later, Roosevelt would mediate a final Russo-Japanese settlement for which he would win the Nobel Peace Prize. Hay's successor, Elihu Root, described him as a perfectly cut stone. The headline on one of Hay's eulogies read, Prince of Peace was loved by all. But in the past century, he has been regarded more as a figure in the corner of other men's portraits. Lincoln's and Roosevelt's name, too. Some of this was his own fault. He was modest and gracious to the end, an exemplary gentleman. Yet beyond being merely the witness, he was very much the author of many crucial and indelible chapters in the history of America in the late 19th century. 
as the nation survived the Civil War and positioned itself in the new world order of the 20th century. <laughs>